Hello, everyone. I guess you are all there. Uh, our next present uh, our next presenter will be Andrew Ben Zakov. Uh, he is from India, and he is currently doing his MAR uh, in the seminary. So we give the time to him. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Bersheba and Mr. Uh, Ranjit for preceding me, which gives me a little bit of space to relax because the topic is almost the same. And most of the concepts of which I have in my paper have been covered a lot. So I will dive right into uh, my topic. Um, my topic today uh, is a comparative study on the concept, concept of rest in the doctrine of the Sabbath and the Hindu belief of Moksha. In many parts of the world, people have lived without knowing or encountering followers of another sect or religion. Religion can be a complicated thing if not studied in the light of its background. In order to understand a person's religion, one must keep in mind the existing culture and tradition of the time. Religion is called a cultural universal because it is found in hu all human societies. Moreover, India is uh, the hub for Hinduism. In addition to this, the people are in liberty to choose and to practice religion of their choice. According to the Constitution of India, Article 25, Section 1, it says, individuals are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and right freely to profess practice and propagate religion. This shows that India, the country India, uh, is uh, the government, though there are riots and though there are different uh, problems which happen to the minorities, but basically from the constitution of India, we see uh, they allow religious pluralism in our country. Going to Adventism, while Adventism can be traced back to the 18th century, Hinduism is a lot more complicated. Unlike other religions, Hinduism does not have a particular starting point which can be traced back to. Hinduism is the predominant religion in India, having the second largest population in the world, consists of rich cultural and cultural heritage. One of its core teachings is the belief in moksha, and I will be specifically speaking about moksha. In the Vedic wisdom tradition, moksha is the liberation of the soul from the cycle of birth death and rebirth and this birth death and rebirth is called the samsara samsara is the cycle so from birth to death and to rebirth this whole thing is a cycle which is called as samsara as for seventh day adventist point of view the ultimate goal is to unite and have a personal relationship with god and to find rest in him the divine being our calling is to join with our Creator. The Sabbath is a time where one meets his need of replenishing and rejuvenation. While traced back to creation account, Sabbath was more of a celebration rather than a burden. Background of Hinduism. Hinduism has basically the, these books, holy and sacred books, which are the four Vedas, the Upanishads, Brahmanas, Arankyas, and Bhagavad Gita. In these books, you will basically find all the religious beliefs and the philosophies of the rishis of your. Mm. Hinduism is a religion of Hindus, a name given to the universal religion which is hailed incomparable in India. It is one of the oldest religions. It is not established by a particular prophet. Buddhism, Christianity, and Mohammedanism owe their starting points to a prophet. Their dates are settled, but for Hinduism, they have no such prophet. This religion respects the profound encounters of rishis of yore as, as its power. 
the Hindus consider self-acknowledgement as their objective. I repeat, they consider self-acknowledgement as their objective. They do not, for most part, offer excessive consideration on material thriving and progression. These books, as mentioned here, are the books which contain the objectives and the goals and paths for every believer. The theme of moksha can be found in the Vedas and the Upanishads. A brief background of Hindu literature is necessary in establishing the value and the importance of the term moksha because it is found and read in their holy books. The concept of moksha in Hinduism. Before we go to that, Vedas are a collection of hymns praising the Vedic gods. Veda means knowledge. And the Upanishads are a part of the Vedas. There are four Vedas which contain important concepts and ideas of Hinduism. And the concept of moksha we can see in these books. So now what is the concept of moksha in Hinduism? The term moksha comes from the Sanskrit word muk, which means to release. And it's also related to mukti, meaning freedom from samsara. Like I said before, samsara is the cycle. Cycle from birth to death and then rebirth. So Hindus believe in rebirth after death, like how uh, Mr. Ranjit pointed out. Additionally, it is also called as vimoksha or vimukti. It is a term commonly used in Hinduism and Hindu logic which alludes to different types of liberation, freedom, and release. Each individual or believer in Hinduism look forward to liberation, freedom, and rest from the burdens, temptations, and desires of this present life. From the beliefs and teaching of the holy book, moksha is considered to be one of the final stages in the person's life. For most Hindus, the highest goal is moksha when one is released from the cycle of birth and rebirth. Moksha is freedom from existence and is liberation which can be attained by knowledge of self-awareness and reality. As you see the picture here, freedom from life and death when you reach the ultimate from freedom from this life. These stages are strong Hindu beliefs which lay the foundation for Hinduism. They live their life in, uh, uh, in awaiting to attain this moksha. There are stages which precede moksha, which will be discussed in this paper. Moksha is understood differently in Hinduism. Now there are different perceptions of this particular moksha in Hinduism itself depending on the school of thought and its interpretation. As mentioned earlier, samsara is a cycle of life. The highest goal is to attain moksha, that is rest from this life. For Hindus, the cycle of birth and rebirth is infinite. There are various stages how one attains moksha. These stages will be studied over here. One of the first stages is Jana. It refers to knowledge of this time of yoga in when the believer strives to attain knowledge of the divine or the absolute. Next we come to bhakti which was already mentioned but I will mention it again please bear with me. Bhakti can be more than just being religious since it can lead to liberation and moksha from his life's addictions and even from the cycle of rebirth and samsara. So the main goal is for them to stop this rebirth. To stop this rebirth and to stop from being born again in terms of another life. Next we come to karma can be associated in the Vedas as rituals or incantations as mantras with, a, with, with a certain sacrifices. Karma is created by each activity a man performs amid their lives and is the working out of karma that determines his state in the samsara. So these are the basically four uh, stages which precede 
reaching the ultimate goal, the ultimate rest, the ultimate liberation and freedom from this present life. Now we're going to see what are the three basic views of moksha. There are three views of moksha. And they are taught in these three. Advaita Vedanta is a school of thought. Vaishnava tradition and the process perspective. According to this view, once liberation is attained, the individual loses their personal identity. According to this view, they lose their personal identity. The soul continues to exist without the body. The soul can exist for a Hindu without a body. This essential understanding of this view establishes the fact that moksha is the ultimate and final step of one's physical existence. This is one of the three basic views taught in Hinduism. Once the person dies, based on its works, it attains liberation. The liberation is also described as a union with the divine being. The next, the Vaishnava tradition, this tradition teaches that Liberation is viewed as a union with the divine. The believer enjoys the bliss and the beauty of God. In this view, we see that the, the soul does have a body and enjoys the benefits of the heavenly world. The previous view showed that the soul is existing without the body, without any physical identity. But in this view, the Hindus believe that yes, both the body the, and the soul enjoy the benefits of the heavenly world. And the next one is the process perspective. This perspective is a combination of all the above views. It could also mean taking part with God, a fully conscious participant in the never-ending creative processes of actualization in infinite being, consciousness and bliss in the ultimate universe. In comparison with the other two views, this view shows how moksha is described as a fellowship with the experience with the divine being. And this view will be taken into consideration when we compare it with the rest of our beliefs of Seventh-day Adventism. This view where the believer in total consciousness and in total identity of himself reaches out and becomes one with the divine being. Concept of Sabbath rest in the Seventh day Adventist Church. The Old Testament testifies that after the Lord had ended his creative act, he rested on the Sabbath, this being the seventh day. This is the Lord's day. It was blessed and sanctified and was to be kept by humans in remembrance of the Creator. It is a literal day from the view of the Seventh day Adventist Church. On purpose, God made the Sabbath doubly special by blessing it and sanctifying it. As you see in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, there is no biblical reference to any other day of the week has been blessed or sanctified by God. It was God's intention to have a day set apart for him. Six days was for daily labor and toil, but the seventh day was for him. It is a day of rejoicing and of gladness. The Sabbath marks the end of creation and is holy. The Israelites were instructed to observe the Sabbath because it was holy in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 15 to 12. Abraham Heschel points out the views. He views the six days as good and the seventh day as holy. God made the six days good and he entered on the seventh day and made it holy. It is an ascent to the summit. The SDA church believes that the Sabbath is a literal day which was instituted before the fall of man. The concept of rest as liberation and freedom, and this is the main crux of the study for today. The point that I'm compa compa the comparison is not the literal day Sabbath rest, but the meaning of rest found in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 to 10. Because in Hinduism, there is no Sabbath. They don't have a literal day of Sabbath, but they do have an ultimate goal, which is seen here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 3 to 10, which will be compared and not the literal day of rest. We see in Hebrews chapter 4, 3 to 10, for the sake of time, you can read through. Um, for we which have believed do rest 
enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in certain places of seventh day on this wise God said, God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. The main crux of this uh, uh, study will be going to verse uh, 9. And there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Chapter so verse 8 says, For it is Jesus had given them rest, they, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. The concept of rest as liberation and freedom in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3 when talks about a rest which is not only literal but is considered as a metaphor for salvation and redemption. And this is the point of contact that we see with Hinduism, the concept of moksha. In Hebrew society, Sabbath was a time of freedom, release and liberation which served as a metaphor for future redemption and liberation they will experience through the messianic redemption. As Samuel Bakyoki says. And here is we come to the next part of Tonstead. He gives the threefold meaning of rest. He speaks of it in, in three different folds. First, he looks at it in, in, in a past. Hebrews looks beyond the narrative and historical fact that are first apparent. With a naked eye, we see the work of creation brought to completion on the seventh day in Genesis story. But with the inner eye, Hebrews sees the ultimate deliverance and restoration ensured even in the original intention of the seventh day. Here we see that uh, this liberation was pointing to what was always there since the beginning, which God was pointing to them to, the, to, to redemption and to salvation. And this was the intention of what Tonstad is saying. The second, in second fold, he says, on the horizontal axis, the sweep of Hebrews is comprehensive. From the outer edge of the past all the way back to the foundation of the world, and from there all the way to the opposite direction to the outer boundary of the future. This is the second rung of the ladder he calls. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear in the second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And here he is speaking about the ultimate rest, the Sabbath rest, which is yet to come. Though it is, as SDA Church, we believe a literal, but it's also a, a, a future tense which we long to see a, a liberation uh, and a freedom from this life and freedom from, from, from chaos where we enter this rest only in Christ. And the third, third uh, fold he points out, he says that Tonstead points out that the rest which still remains will be fulfilled in Christ, affirming a future event. All is not finished and complete. While the people on its long list of Old Testament witness all had faith and were faithful, they did not see the hope materialize any more than the believers in the present. These passages speak about a day which has not yet arrived. A non-fulfillment, a non-entry, and a day that is yet to come. Uh, finally, he points out that the rest is not only a future event, but also speaks to the present experience of the believer, which we can enter this rest now, when we accept Christ. The book of Hebrews, the writer is trying to convince the, the readers to, 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 to keep faith and this rest is, is a rest which is pointing towards the future, the rest that we will experience in Christ, the rest which is yet to come, but we can also experience this rest when we ask Christ to come inside us. The important point of this study is two words, that is kataparsis and sabbatismos. There is a progression of word from kataparsis to sabbatismos. In, in chapter 9, he uses the word Sabbatismos, while in the whole chapter preceding it, he uses the word katapausis. Katapausis signifies a cessation from labor so that the weary body is rested and refreshed. So here he's speaking of a physical rest. But when he goes further into chapter verse 9, this is the only time this word is used in the Bible, Sabbatismos. It's not only a physical rest, but it's also a religious rest. Sabbatismus, a rest of sacred 
kind which both the soul and the body partake it is true whether we understand the rest as referring to gospel blessings or to eternal felicity or to both the sabbath commemorating the creator's rest is a microcosm of the life of faith that points beyond itself to rest in the recreated promised land to be enjoyed by those who maintain loyalty to him so here we see that two goals for christians in particular seven the adventists who look to this ultimate goal of reaching this ultimate liberation and rest in christ and hinduism the moksha also to liberate themselves and reach this particular goal uh, i i believe my time is up but i will uh, these are different uh, quotations from scholars who who talk about the ultimate rest in context of hebrews um uh chapter number 4 um let's go to the similarities and the differences the similarities we see in hinduism is the liberation and freedom both want liberation and freedom we see the concept of wandering in hinduism they wander from rebirth to rebirth and for for us we we wander away from the creator where we where we are longing to reunite with the creator the rest we get and we unite with the divine in the hinduism that they, they uh, reunite with the brahman and for sd church we reunite with christ the differences we see here for hinduism salvation is by works and for sd church salvation is only through christ and no other rituals liberation and freedom is seen through self self assertion and all the practices which you do but rest and freedom of the sd church is seen only through christ for hinduism there is no literal sabbath day but for an as from an sda point of view literal there is a literal sabbath which is a mini fulfillment of the ultimate rest that we will see so every sabbath that we experience god is pointing us to the ultimate rest uh, which we will reunite with him at his second coming for the hinduism um, there is birth death and rebirth but for the sda church we do not we believe in birth death and then resurrection in christ and there is no rebirth our ultimate goal is to enter the rest as discussed in this paper and it comes only through christ consequently moksha is a stage where the believers unite with the divine and liberation is attained in both these concepts now this can be a point of contact when we reach out to the hinduisms in point of uh, approach instead of approaching them in a more of a doctrinal way of expressing what sabbath is with rules but if we if we talk to them of uh, what salvation is that we too believe in salvation and the ultimate rest that we have in christ and we can also experience this rest right now because for them moksha is something which is attained only after that for most for most of them but for us we have a mini fulfillment of what we are going to see and if this can be a point of contact where salvation salvation in christ can can bridge the gap and then from there because to speak doctrines is it's not the best approach like we read of uh, uh, and how we how we uh, heard from vesa presenters our approach has to be different and we see that there is a common point salvation and moksha and liberation and attaining this common rest from christ for the sda church and for hinduism um uh, uh, if we can approach them in this way the significance of redemption and salvation must not be neglected from this study hence the two distinct religions with similar goals but divergent religious beliefs in attaining it so if this could be a point of contact where we can reach out to them this aspect of rest for us reaching the divine and the and the rest for moksha it will be a yet it also gives place for study for later on and this is our study uh, and this is my approach thank you thank you so much brother andrew uh since we are running out of time we wouldn't have any question and thank you so much for listening <laughs>